Uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. <laughs> Thanks for the waves, wave to each other. Um, so I thought we'd start with another little um, resourcing uh, practice. This is uh, it's very, very simple. And it's in a way, it, it's just keeping that, uh, well, it's helping keep the, the mind sort of buoyant. As I was saying yesterday, this, the, this practice can be quite challenging at times, just being with what's, what's there. Um, so there's that, but it, 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 it also keeps, um, as Raj created in the puja last night, just keeps that thread of metta or self, self and other, keeps that sort of uh, context in mind too. So this is from um, Chris Germa, a little exercise called In For Me, Out For You. And I'll maybe just extend it, it slightly. And the basic idea is that on the, on the in-breath, uh, we, we breathe in warmth and friendliness, self-care. Uh, we, we breathe that in, we take it into uh, our own body, our own being. On each out breath, uh, we let that warmth and love naturally flow to others. That's what we're doing. It's very, very simple. But I suggest we just just start just sitting, and I'll I'll um, I'll say a few um, words by way of guiding us through. sitting in just quite a natural way. Noticing how the body feels, how the breath wants to be breathed. Eyes can be open or closed. But we're letting the energy turn inwards. Resting at home within ourselves. Resting within the body. Resting with the breath within the body. Allowing the breath to help connect you with how you are in this moment. And doing that in quite a light way, a loose way. Don't need to search too much for how you are. or hold on tightly to any particular moment. And let that sense of how you are just rest with the flow and the movement of the breath.
And on the next in-breath, seeing if it's possible to breathe in some sense of warmth, friendliness, self-care. And on each out breath, releasing that warmth, friendliness and love into the world, letting it flow to others. You don't need to have particular others in mind, though you may find they arise, images, feeling for someone in particular. Keep it very simple. In for you, in for me, sorry, out for you. In for yourself, out for others. And you might find at some point that distinction relaxes to the point where it's simply the wholeness of the breath and a sense of care, sense of warmth. without distinction, it's freely available. when you're ready, just coming back to the screen in your own time. Perhaps taking the feeling of that little practice into uh, resting your eyes on the screen, taking in each other. Okay. So this morning I want to uh, talk about Right View in particular. So I'm drawing from chapter four in my book, which is all about Right View. Um, yeah, okay. 
So I want to start uh, just by way of um, putting right view in in context in a in a couple of different ways, maybe a few different ways, and then talking more practically about how how we sort of train in this perspective. Um, sometimes I talk about it as the perspective of how the Buddha would have thought, which is maybe putting it a little bit grandly, um, but it's, it's that Dharma perspective in the back of the mind. So there are two ways of calming the mind, uh, two main ways um, in early Buddhist practice. Uh, and though the purpose of practice is not to calm the mind, um, it's to understand what's happening, um, free ourselves and others from suffering caused by misunderstanding, or misperceiving uh, our world, our experience. Calm is helpful. Calm is a helpful basis on which to be able to um, investigate the mind. So calm comes mainly through the absence of klesha, the absence of afflictive emotions and, and an agitation uh, in the mind. So this is relevant to the practice that we're doing because there's one way of calming the mind is through um, one pointed practice or through um, samatha practice or practices where we are more clearly directing the mind to a single point. Um, and there, uh, the calm comes through the focusing on mainly on one object uh, or a specific object and allowing the hindrances to go into abeyance. Um, in, in a sense, they, they, the, the mind is caught with one particular object. Um, it holds itself to it and develop, can develop quite a sort of powerful concentration from that, which, which brings about many positive and pleasurable things into the mind. So the hindrances go into abeyance. Um, that's the first way. And uh, yeah. So the second way is, is more what we're doing. Um, so here we use right view, uh, right view or a Dharma perspective in the back of the mind um, to calm uh, the mind. So how we think about what's happening, um, our ideas and our attitudes towards uh, the experiences that we're having, um, whether that's something like uh, the experience of pain, uh, the experience of um, emotional pain or agitation, uh, experience of something happening that we don't want to happen so aversion arises in the mind um, how how we relate to those experiences has a big effect on whether we increase the amount of agitation in the mind or whether we calm it calms down um, and when we're able to bring um, the more sort of unbiased or this sort of calm, interested uh, attitude to what's happening, um, we tend not to increase the agitation in the mind uh, or the reactivity in the mind. Um, If you like, a, a curiosity curiosity is is almost opposite to the the energy of uh, klesha or afflictive emotion or reactive the reactive mind. When there's curiosity there about what's happening, uh, it's much harder for if you like the flames of reactivity to keep um, growing. They might still keep burning for a while, 
but on the whole, they're, they're not being fed. They're not being fed by uh, the, the, the calmness, the openness, um, the clear knowing in the mind. And um, yeah, if you might think of an example of um, perhaps when you felt quite agitated or annoyed or about something and uh, somebody else just says uh, the right thing. It, it just says something that, that maybe helps you see another perspective or it just uh, helps calm the mind down. So if you like there, you, you may have um, somebody else sort of representing some degree of right view. But what we're doing is learning to do that for ourselves, learning to have that within the mind. A part of the mind is able to um, relate to experience in a slightly different way, a new way. So there's a, a relate, an idea related to this, which is, is um, again, in, in early Buddhism, you have a sense of the, the object of experience and the mind, the awareness that is knowing what's happening. So we use the dualistic framework, if you like, to see um, what's happening. Usually we're, we're quite enmeshed with our, our anger or our, um, the emotional pain um, looking to use the again these qualities of awareness to get a slightly different um, view on what's happening there's there's that which is being known and there's the knowing of it that knowing perspective or sometimes you can talk about that as the observing mind and the qualities of the aware mind, the observing mind, are not of the same nature as what's being observed or what's being known. So the quality of awareness in the observing mind is different to the quality of um, the nature of the aversive mind. That sort of destructive, um, fiery, um, um, that, that's more the nature of something like aversion. It has these particular qualities, whereas awareness, mindfulness has other qualities. So you're bringing the positive and skillful qualities of awareness to bear on what, uh, what else is happening in uh, experience. And that, that perspective, that aware right view perspective calms down uh, eventually calms down the um, what's happening in the knowing minds. But even while it doesn't, you might have, the, you might be quite aware of quite strong, um, uh, not necessarily particularly skillful states, but as long as awareness, you can be aware of them, you can hold them in the mind, then that's okay. You know that it's not a particularly helpful or particularly skillful experience, but your awareness neither feeds it so that it grows uh, and it doesn't suppress it. Uh, it just watches. It just uh, learns about the nature of uh, what's happening, the nature of aversion, the nature of craving, the nature of anxiety or agitation. And it, it learns from this karma um, interested perspective. So right view in this way stabilizes the mind. It allows you to, to notice what's going on without um, furthering reactivity and furthering suffering in the mind. And at some point it, it will, that suffering will decrease. And I'll, I'll talk a lot more about this um, probably in a couple of days when we get on to looking at craving and aversion in more detail. Um, but for now, just, just to flag up this, this quite different ways really of, of 
calm. Uh, one is calm through samadhi, the first, the first one, and the second is calm through right view. And it's, it's calm so that we can observe what's happening. It's not calm in the sense that uh, um, all the sort of disruptive forces in the mind have, have left, they've left the room, they've gone. Uh, they can still be there, but they're able to, um, they're, they're harnessed, if you like, they're harnessed by the, the power of the aware mind. Okay, so that's a, the first thing. Um, I wanted to say a little bit more about right view. Uh, and, and in a way, why I'm talking about right view in relation to the Satipatthana Sutta. I mean, it is, it is there. Um, but I, yeah, traditionally, um, right view is related to an understanding or belief in the Four Noble Truths, the Four Noble Truths, but also karma. Um, so really it's about understanding what leads to suffering and what leads to freedom. And in the law of karma, there's an, there's an understanding that uh, our, our beneficial thoughts and acts lead to um, happy, mind they lead to sort of skillful uh, outcomes um, and an unskillful deed produces uh, uh, an unhappy result at some point and then the four noble truths is you it's, it's really an understanding of the the nature of or the the causes of our suffering um, suffering is dependent upon craving or when craving ceases through our practice of the Noble Eightfold Path, then um, our suffering ceases and we cease to inflict that suffering on, on others as part of that. So, um, one of the ways this can be expressed is that things don't happen just because uh, of our desire that they happen. Um, they happen because of the causes and conditions that are in place. So, so both the teaching of, of karma and the Four Noble Truths are about conditionality. So this is the, the, the nub, if you like, of right view. And it may be that our, our desires, our desires will be a factor, there'll be some of the causes and conditions, but they're not the only thing. Um, I quite often use the example of um, losing weight, uh, just because it's one I'm quite familiar with. You know, we, we don't lose, lose weight just because, I don't lose weight just because I want to. I, I can have all the sort of desire in the world to lose weight, but unless I am careful about what I'm eating, unless I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, more active, uh, not just sitting around on the couch, you know, then that won't happen. All, all the, the will, all the desire in the world won't work unless uh, I'm paying attention to the, the causes and conditions that support um, that particular effect of, of losing weight. I believe it's Sabuti who said he, he thinks if we um, reflected more on conditionality and, and karma conditionality, then we would um, make really strong progress in our, in our spiritual lives. It's absolutely key to, um, un to, to understanding is, you know, the, the Buddha's central, central message. So right view in relation to Satipatthana Sutta. So, so I think there's a lot of similarity in um, right view and the fourth Satipatthana, uh, Dhamma Nupassana. Um, and in fact, the, the Dhamma Nupassana is, it, it, there are all these lists of Dharma teachings in there, which can be, we can use to sort of, as right views in themselves, 
we can view our experience through the perspective of the skandhas or through the perspective of the hindrances. They, they're each a Dharma perspective in their own right, each of the lists within the Satipatthana Sutta. Um, but the, the meaning of, um, of Dhammas, well, there are different meanings. One of, one of the meanings which is applicable here um, is of the, it's a perspective of the Dhamma, a Dhamma perspective. And it's this Dhamma perspective that is, that we apply, if you like, to each of the other three Satipatthanas. So all of our experience, it's, it's the perspective from which to view the rest of our experience of, of body, of feelings, of mind. And a, a second um, meaning of dhammas, dhammas as phenomena. Um, so phenomena, um, in a way, are quite sort of momentary arisings. Uh, phenomena, something that's, that's flowing, it's happening all the time, it's moving. Um, and this is where the, the terminology around objects comes, objects of experience, happenings, arisings, um, objects. There are different, different ways you can talk about it, or phenomena. Um, so it's this, this perspective on our experience, our direct experience of continually sort of moving, changing um, flow of experience. So with the right view perspective or the, the Dharma Nupassana perspective, we're becoming more objective about our experience, our subjective experience. Um, and we're relating to the, the nature of experience, the Dhamma nature of experience. Um, so that experience uh, from the Dharma perspective, from the Buddha's perspective, like our experience is of the nature of change. It's, it's not fixed. Um, uh, or having some sort of central, sort of substantial entity. Um, and resisting change or resisting, uh, not understanding the, the fluid nature of experience is what causes our suffering. So with the, this perspective of objects, we're looking to train the mind to see through the lens of uh, what's more the nature of experience. Um, you could also talk about process, uh, experience as process rather than um, the, the things. Um, yeah, of, often we translate uh, our content into specific sort of things, um, my body, my mind, um, my, my thoughts. Yeah, and we take ownership of them uh, in that process. So we're training the mind um, both to be with direct experience, perhaps the, the awareness be with direct experience rather than the ideas about things or the, the concepts. We won't forget the concepts, we'll know the concepts. That's, that's part of our, our sort of perceptual um, apparatus, if you like. Um, it's, we're always going to know the content um, when we need to, but it gives us more access, this perspective to um, the nature, the experience of things more as they are when we're able to observe directly. Um, 
so yeah, I want to uh, say something about the language of of objects. Um, something Bantu Bantu talks about. Well, this is what he says about it. Um, He says, although your state of consciousness is subjective, your state of mind is subjective, but when you think about it or become aware of it, you make it into an object. Uh, you can turn you, the subject, into you, the object. You don't just experience, for example, sense desire. Um, you know that you experience it. So you've got that model that I was using before. You've, you've not just the... Um, experience of sense desire where you're sort of enmeshed with the experience you've got the experience and you've got the knowing of it so you don't just experience sense desire you know that you experience it your desire for sense experience or enjoyment is part of your subjectivity but when you become aware of this desire you make it into an object and so that's from living with awareness in case anyone is curious about that So a couple of things around this, because I think it, it can be, um, yeah, what, what, what's helpful about this con concept, if you like, this idea, this language of, of ob objects. Um, so another little Bhante quote, he says, he says, we can't have clarity without meta objectifying our perceptions. Um, I, I'm tempted and sometimes I do substitute awareness for clarity, but I, th I think it works with clarity. We can't have clarity, clear awareness, without meta objectifying our perceptions. So meta, if you like, is part of what enables objectivity. It enables us to look clearly, um, you know, seeing self more clearly, seeing the nature of self more clearly. Um, seeing self and others uh, more clearly and more kindly. So I, I, I like that those two are, um, there's such a close relationship actually. We can think of objectivity or an object as being a bit cool um, or a bit distant, but actually Bhante's saying, uh, we can't actually see someone um, objectively, unless we already have meta in that lens, that way of looking. Saido Utejaniya has something to say in this area too. Um, I can find it. I'm not sure I can find it. Um, oh yeah. He says, sometimes we hear the language of, of objectivity and um, pick up on um, some sort of detachment. In a way, we're looking to, to um, step back a little, see more clearly what's happening. And, uh, and that can bring the feeling that there's, um, some sort of taking an enjoyment away or not being so sort of um, intimate with, with what's happening. And what he's saying is that we, if you like, we're looking to detach from klesha, to detach from afflictive emotion, that which causes us suffering in order to be able to see it more clearly. Um, we're still involved. Uh, but there's a wiser involvement, um, there's more discernment, and there's more um, involvement um, on the basis of love, on the basis of metta. So we're detached from attachment, but we're not detached from loving or from life. Um, so or, or an, another way of talking about this is to do with um, personal or, or impersonal. And again, impersonal can sound a little bit 
cool. Uh, but when you think about not taking things personally, that has a different sort of flavor. Because I think probably we're all aware of how painful it is at times when we take things personally, um, take them as saying something about me. And we feel that sort of protective um, instinct really uh, to protect uh, self, protect what, what someone's saying about me. So that the pain of taking things personally, um, it's uh, quite a bit of our dukkha comes from that. So this perspective of seeing things a little bit more clearly through the right view perspective, um, we're able to notice uh, things like that, be taking something personally. And there's also the pain of attachment um, when we attached and particularly when we lose what we're attached to, whether it be a favorite thing that breaks or a person who uh, dies or leaves us. You know, there's all sorts of ways in which our uh, attachment causes great pain. And so what I think Right View can do is help purify the mind from uh, being attached with defilement um, to a more um, pure, kind of um, wise involvement, a more pure kind of, of love and well-wishing uh, and connection with ourselves and with others. Uh, I've got a quote from Byron Katie, which I, I love. Uh, this is about attachment, actually. She's, she says, we don't attach to people or things. We attach to uninvestigated concepts that we believe to be true in the moment. We don't attach to people or things. We attach to uninvestigated concepts that we believe to be true in the moment. Um, maybe our uninvestigated concept is around um, this, this, this person uh, belongs to me in some way, uh, or this thing is uh, mine. Um, so actually the idea is that right view helps us be able to um, recognize through the power of awareness and this Dhamma perspective, recognize um, and investigate these ideas that we hold and perhaps we've held uh, for a very long time um, in the process of the um, conditioning that happens through our lives. So we can, if you like, with awareness and right view, we, we are able to look freshly at each moment, what each moment holds and about how, how we're uh, relating to experience. Richard Gombrich, the scholar Richard Gombrich, he talks about learning to see the world through Buddhist colored spectacles. Very nice. Um, and to, to some extent, when we all have uh, some, some Dharma training, some, some of you have many, many years of, of Dharma training. And that works in the back of the mind, that influences how we think about certain, or how we think about our lives, how we think about other people. Um, and this way of using right view, it's, it's something that just can be in the back of our minds um, during uh, meditation. When the mind is very open, it's just looking to see what's happening um, it's able to look back at the uh if you like back through the sort of web of um, perhaps assumptions or ideas that we have that we don't necessarily um know that we hold um, but it gives us a way of, the receptive practice gives us a way of accessing 
um, more, more of this um, uninvestigated stuff where we come from. So I want to say just how this works practically, how what we do in the practice and the practice on and off the cushion. So the couple of things. So firstly, it is around this language of, of objects, happenings, arisings. So each moment that we're present, um, different um, arisings, objects will be happening through the senses. Um, and we can recognize how we're relating to the experience that's arising. Uh, are we seeing it as some sort of um, momentary happening in the mind? Or is there some sort of taking hold of it? The mind takes hold um, and fixes it in some sort of way. So we can recognize that, but we can also just train in just in the same way that we drop in um, the reminders to be aware, the reminders or the rem rememberings to be in the present moment. We can drop in this perspective of right view as uh, objects, drop that into the mind in uh, experience. A reminder of that perspective. Um, and implicit in that perspective of objects or happenings is the perspective of, of karma, uh, perspe the perspective of conditionality and the Four Noble Truths. So it's like a, a real shorthand um, for all of the things that I've said before, actually, today. One other um, question that we can drop in that can be really helpful is, is what's the point of view in the mind right now? Because um, I'm talking about right view, but we're always coming from some sort of view, some sort of perspective. And it can be, you won't necessarily get an answer if you ask that question, but sometimes it might become clear, oh, right, I'm coming from um, a perspective of, I don't know, trying to get what I want from this situation. Um, so there's desire is in the driving seat of the experience. And, and that becomes a bit more easily seen. Um, sometimes when I'm um, thinking about, I have a, a little bit of a treat mentality. And um, so sometimes I'll catch that point of view in my mind. Oh, when I've done this thing, which is quite hard work or, or whatever, I'll treat myself at the end. And um, so sometimes what, I'll, what will come after that thought is, well, would the Buddha have thought in that way? Uh, did the Buddha have a treat mind? And it's like, well, no, <laughs> that's not really part of right view, is it? So it just, it just sort of flags things up. It's not that it's wrong to have treats, but it just... In a way, it's a moment of seeing where um, there's a more conditioned perspective in the mind rather than um, right view. And I'm sure Vajra Priya is going to hold me to this when I want my post-retreat takeaway treat. <laughs> so. so it can be quite fun if you like noticing uh, these different um, points of view. Sometimes what, what, the, what the mind thinks is we don't quite realize how um, crude it is or how unreasonable it is or uh, until we, we in a way get hold of the tail end of a view and we're able perhaps to tease it into the light of awareness. Oh, that's the perspective. That's what the mind is thinking. And, and maybe it might be sort of quite mean. You might be surprised at how Oh, you know, I didn't think I was that sort of person anymore. But you know, it's it's we bring these 
aspects of our, our motivation and ourself into the light of awareness without judgment, um, but, but simply to, to learn. Um, so what's, what's the point of view in the mind? And then another thing which we can do, which I'll, I'll drop in is um, use the passive voice. So we talked already a couple of days ago about the, the language, type of language that, um, and, and the different effects that language can have. I forget in what context now. Um, but I learned this from Joseph Goldstein many years ago, and uh, he would, oh, it was in relation to mind, wasn't it? The mind or my mind, a question. Um, so in a meditation, um, it's easy for the implicit sort of language to be, I'm hearing a sound or I'm hearing a car or I'm, um, I'm thinking. That, that's the sort of implicit, even though we don't usually do the, 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 the long hand, if you like. Um, so something like um, sound is known, uh, knowing a thought. Um, yeah, that, that sort of passive language can um, help us have that perspective of, of right view. This is something that's arising in experience, uh, not automatically taking ownership of uh, experience as, as mine um, to do with me or not me. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll try those things out in the meditation um, that I'll lead through in a bit. I'm just looking to see if there's any last thing I want to say. No, I think I'll leave it there and let's see if there are any, any comments or questions or anything not not clear, you'd like to clarify. And, okay. Um, Ali, do you like to unmute yourself? Morning. Morning. Um, what's the point of view in the mind right now? Um, it just made me laugh <laughs> and smile because, um, I think a lot of this stuff I use without knowing why I use it. So what I'm finding this week is you're giving me the the framework for what I'm doing. So I'm finding that really helpful. But what I wanted to say was um, about five years ago, my husband and I separated. It was a mutually agreed separation. It was very grown up and as amicable as it could be under the difficult circumstances. But what I found myself saying to somebody one day was, oh, my husband's left me. <laughs> and it was kind of like, oh, woe is me. My husband's left me. And I could hear myself saying it. And I could hear myself saying, Alison, that is just absolutely not true. <laughs> but it was, I don't know, there's a bit of society like, oh, you know, I, I must be really awful because it's so hard that I'm, I've been left. But it wasn't. You know, in reality, it wasn't really. I mean, there was an element of that, but mainly, it was okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> but yeah. there's kind of these stories we tell ourselves, and this sort of the why we tell them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, yeah, the the conditioning from society around us is just one of the things that sort of, in a way, molds our story, isn't it? It's yeah, yeah. But, re but it's really helpful, like you say, you laughed about it. So it's good to spot those. It's like, oh, oh yeah, what's, <laughs> you know, how, how, how am I seeing myself in that moment that that, you know, that, that story is coming out? And, and also yeah. what effect does it have? What does it, it reinforce, really? Yes. Yeah. 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 I sometimes ask what, what's, um, well, you say, what's the point? What's the purpose of it? Yeah. What's it telling me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I and I do laugh quite a lot at because it I kind of see it quite subjectively. Yeah, 
and uh, quite objectively rather and it's like oh yeah it's just kind of over there doing that thing again but that's not actually really true yeah yeah really good because I think that that um I think that especially when the humor comes into it it just gives us a lot of freedom mm. freedom to to not sort of attach to our particular story mm. and just yes. reinforce what that says about yeah. us yeah yeah great um, John, John, you've got a comment or a question. Yeah, thank you, Raja Devi. Um, this is more of a comment than a question. Um, in your book, you use the you use the wonderful word declump in the context of uh, right view and awareness, and I find that particularly helpful as because I feel very strongly relate to that feeling when things get clogged up your mind or my mind. And it's useful to declump. So it's something that stuck with me, and I found a very useful, um, practical reminder of what we're trying to do. Mm. So just to say thank you for that, and I hope you still use the word. I didn't. I didn't pick it up this morning, but I thought it was very, very, very good. Good. I, I'd actually. I hadn't. Um, thanks for reminding me. I hadn't remembered. I'd, I'd used that made-up word. Um, yeah. 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 But I, um, I said, yes, that sense of as, as those different images. Sometimes I use a, a ball of wool. It's like we sort of, we, we can just get the tail end of something and that helps us gradually um, through observation, through observation with this perspective, uh, it enables something that has been a, a clump uh, to, to just slightly sort of, um, fall apart in that maybe we just are able to recognize or name oh there's that bit of it and then there's oh there's this and yeah each time we're able to recognize a little bit more even even without a name there's a bit more freedom in the mind a bit less identification with you know this clump okay so let's try and bring back declumping <laughs> Um, is there anyone else who who uh, wanted to say anything or anything not clear that you want to clarify? Nanette. Nan. Do you want to unmute Nan? Thank you. There we go. Yes, um, hello everybody. Um, I'm finding this absolutely fascinating really because as you were talking, I've got a phrase here that I sometimes think of, which is, it's psychological speak really, I suppose, breaking the ties that bind. And there's so many ties around that are linked to the mind. And I think that it's such a, a kind of, um, an intelligent way of looking at uh, releasing neural pathways and conditioning that I experience every day and we all experience, I suppose. So um, I'm hoping I'm, that with, with faith, of course, that I can apply and think through these concepts a little in, in a bit more detail because it so much makes sense, um, but it's really, I mean, in my experience, is that it does work. I've been sat in meditation for over the years, coming and going, I suppose. And I know it, I know it helps, helps me greatly. <clears throat> but it's that thing about the disconnect between the self that is here or not here or whatever. So it's very, it is complex, isn't it? I'm sure we all find it com a complex experience. But uh, I th uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying the way that it's being kind of unpicked and the reference to all our texts that we use. Um, so thank you very much. I'm hoping to get, you know, much more from it, of course, as we go along. OK, thank you. Yeah, I, I think just um, just I'll just pull out one thing from a number of things that you said, and that's the the complexity of our experience. And I think one of the the really beautiful things about this practice is that however much complexity is going on, however big the clump is or the story is, um, 
you mentioned faith now and I think if if there's some faith in mindfulness in mindfulness and uh the Dharma perspective in a way to sit with and observe what's happening from that Dharma perspective that can be very simple if you like we can bring real simplicity to something um I mean, the thinking mind is, is, is creates a lot of complexity um that's its its nature if you like that's its nature and its job but to be able to um bring something of a different nature that's actually just um simple um but with potentially a lot of uh, that's its strength if you like that's its strength and its power simplicity and clear knowing yeah then then it means we don't have to sort of get really involved in trying to un unbind or unplump or whatever it is actually we can yeah. way let the awareness do its job which is to let that happen awareness and, and dharma perspective will work on what's being seen but sometimes we need to give them a chance uh to to work to keep recognizing this is what's there there's this big ball of conflicted stuff in the mind recognize that what's what's that like bring some curiosity to that well i just try to bring back and come back into the moment as and when either through meditation or in you know daily activity and actions and relationships with others and um yeah sounds quite straightforward but it's uh, sometimes difficult but thank you very much Great. Okay, let's. Um, oh, Rita Moon, go with you, and then we'll have a break. Yeah, I just, I just really, really, really quick. I'm just wondering, Roger Davy, is there any place in this conversation for um, no view? So when, when I hear you talking about right view, um, I feel kind of emotionally that what I'm trying to do is move from wrong view to right view, that I'm somehow trying to purify or at least notice um, the wrong views of which there seem to be quite a cue <laughs> in my experience sometimes um and i'm trying to use this dharma perspective to kind of notice the view that i have towards very often as people actually because i you know, we, we emote in relation to people i'm thinking of a meeting recently with one um a group of people one particular person who just just annoys me um even if they share the same view as me i, I still get annoyed that they expressed it before <laughs> me or something i don't know what it is but um I, I, and I've been trying to notice and use that more objective um, um, or dharmic perspective and kind of say, look, you, I mean, you bring this particular thing to this group, to this particular person, um, to the extent to which I don't see the person, I just see the projection that I have of them. So when I see that, I go, oh, OK, that's a wrong view. That's quite interesting. Sometimes I can disconnect from it. It doesn't necessarily mean I have now a right view towards them. I might go quite quiet in the meeting and realize, actually, once I take away all the fuel <clears throat> of ill will towards this person, I don't actually have any view towards them. Um, I can feel quite neutral towards them, which is actually quite pleasant, really. Um, it can cause me to be really quite quiet. Um, I mean, I should say I am an extroverted thinker and I, I do tend to over talk. Um, and sometimes when I notice that more and more, it just leads me to be more quiet more of the time. So I'm just wondering, is there something about, is that the direction we're moving towards having kind of no views? Ideally, I mean, not, not all of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, that's an interesting, it's interesting area because I think um, right view can, can sound quite active. Um, um, and I am sort of pointing to certain um, teachings, expressions of, of right view. And yet I think what they do is that they help set up a, um, a perspective of non-bias uh, or a more sort of impartial perspective. So I think if you like, that is part of the right view perspective. It allows things to be seen um, more clearly and that that allows like you say the projections and the sort of conditionings that the views a large part of right view i think is that it sets up this perspective that allows other views to be seen to be noticed um and then yeah what's left is a is a clearer seeing um of of someone 
or, or of something in ourselves or a situation. Um, and I think often that is quite quiet. I think hopefully it's a quiet that's infused with some sort of um, um, some sort of matter, some sort of uh, or equanimity, some sort of balance in the mind uh, towards what's happening. Um, yeah. So, so if you like, we're using right using a framework, and if you like, a framework of right view to um, access. Uh, well, yeah, 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 which is not dissimilar from no view, actually. Uh, I think, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Okay, let's let's have a, um, a break and come back at quarter to twelve, and we'll sit then. We'll start in a minute or so. If you'd like to set up your posture, please. Sure. Okay, that seemed quite a short break, didn't it? So I'll, I'll lead us uh, probably most of the way through the practice and then um, a little bit of time, hopefully, just for you to work with it in your own way. And um, I'll read something at the end from um, Shempen Hukum's book, keeping the Dalai Lama waiting. So it's from a, a, a different Buddhist tradition, but I think it's um, she's saying something uh, quite similar about right view. And we also may be accompanied by um, sound, some particular sounds, uh, the rain hitting the cabin roof. That's what it is. Sometimes people are a little concerns or their mind goes with, with the um, particular sounds. Anyway, that's what it is. So tuning into yourself, 
tuning into whatever aspect of your experience presents itself. Remembering that seeing meditation is also a possibility. And sometimes the seeing aspect of practice can help us through consciously softening the gaze, softening the eyes, noticing what's happening in the peripheral vision. And this can mirror the way in which the mind can soften and relax. We're not staring down experience, we're simply opening to it. Or it might be that your attention is going to sounds. Recognizing that hearing is happening. Sound is being known. Knowing sound, knowing sensations. Knowing sounds, knowing silence. Knowing thinking and knowing the absence of thoughts.
there's the sound and there's the knowing of the sound. Receiving what's happening, letting the experience come to you. Remembering to settle back. Remembering to Come to the present moment. Notice what's happening there. And every now and again, just reminding yourself of a Dharma perspective, objects arising in experience. Rather than my experience or what I'm knowing, what I'm wanting to happen. Without judgment, just noticing any more of the more personal perspectives that arise, simply conditioned arisings as well. Noticing our conditioned habits from the perspective of right view. Simply another object, an arising or a happening moment.
And every now and again, you can just drop in that perspective, helping the mind orient to right view, to the perspective of things always arising, dependent upon causes and conditions. Objects of experience. And taking the eye out of experience, using the passive voice. Sensation is known. Knowing thoughts in the mind. arising, persisting for perhaps a very short time and then gone. And every now and again, you might drop in the question. What's the point of view in the mind? Where is the mind coming from? Not expecting an answer necessarily, but to stimulate interest and curiosity in the nature of the mind. in the nature of experience and awareness.
if you find that you're getting a bit lost or confused, experience becoming quite complex, just simply settle back into the present moment. Keep knowing the present moment.
Lama Shempen Hukum. Seeing the true nature of mind was what I was trying to do, and I needed to cultivate it through mindfulness. I asked Bokar Rinpoche, isn't mindfulness about focusing on the here and now in our direct experience, moment by moment? He said it was, but that did not mean becoming absorbed in all kinds of experiences. He said that when I had the right view, I should rest in that, whatever I was doing. I asked, is right view seeing the true nature of mind? Yes, he replied, look, look again and again at the mind to see its true nature. For some people, seeing the true nature of mind is a powerful experience of everything dropping away for a while, leaving them in a vast and even scary space of emptiness. For me, it was just momentary glimpses of an another way of knowing beyond the thinking process, intriguing yet fleeting. These glimpses were enough to keep me constantly inspired. So we have a few minutes before lunch. Just had a question um, from Riju Muni about the, the reading. Um, so it will go up on the Padlet as the other readings um, have done. So you can access it there. But if you have the book, Keeping the Dalai Lama Waiting, then it's on page 116. So anybody like to uh, say anything about um, that last practice, how it was for them? Perhaps maybe someone, um, if, there's, if there are people that we haven't yet heard from, um, I know it's not everybody's preferred way of communicating. Um, but yeah, some of you have written to me, which is lovely. And um, you can also use the chat if you prefer. But just anything about how something that you noticed, maybe quite a momentary noticing in your direct experience um, that you want to talk about. Okay, well, let's open it up to, perhaps if you have already spoken, then you might want to say you might have something. Um, try and keep it to your direct experience. Yeah.
see ya. Hello, Vajra Devi. Hi. I'm sorry, I'm coming to this late. I, I've just joined the retreat today, so you may already have spoken about this, but I do find that I get very discursive. Is, that, is it quite common that I'll latch, I'll notice a thought and then I'll think about, oh, here's a thought. And then I'll start thinking, oh, well, where did that come from? And what does that mean? And, you know, I followed many of your guided meditations and sometimes I, I notice I can have followed a thought all the way through and missed half of your, your comments. Mm. Is that common? It is the nature of the thinking mind. It is, it is, you know, thinking, um, it, it's, it's raison d'etre as it, it, it wants to think. So, um, I think there's a, um, quite a fine balance between observing and being aware of, of a thought and just that sort of slippering, slippering in, slipping into, uh, the content. And once we're in the content, it can take us um it, it, yeah it can take us a while if you like before we're we uh come back onto the riverbank if you like having gone in the river of <laughs> thoughts and thinking um so what i did say earlier in the retreat which it's maybe worth reminding people of is is to have that that grounding in um in the physical senses but to particularly tactile sensations of of the body and just sort of open up to thoughts um, and thinking quite briefly initially. Um, probably going to talk about thoughts in the next day or so more, how, how to work with, with thoughts and thinking. Um, but really looking to when you do notice a thought, this is a thought, uh, recognize that thinking is happening in the mind. How does that feel? Uh, how does a thought feel in the mind? Um, maybe, maybe just for a few seconds, and then it's like, okay, registered that. Um, so we're a little bit more sort of um, directive here because we're looking to uh, do what's helpful for awareness. That, that's always the, the, the reason for doing things, if you like. It's not because we dislike being lost in thoughts. Um, then you need to recognize uh, some aversion in the mind if that's the case the the motivation is always what's helpful to awareness and if you recognize that quite regularly thinking's a difficult object for you which it is for many people then um, it's like okay so what's helpful then and what's what what i'm suggesting is helpful is to to do it for a short period of time and then ground and give um, mindfulness an, an object that's a bit more tangible, uh, body sensation, a bit more tangible to help, if you like, strengthen it, help build its muscles a little bit so that um, mm. you know, the next time you um, open up to the mind more broadly, um, maybe, maybe it's possible to be there a little bit longer and thinking is happening, uh, knowing a thought as a thought. Um, yeah, so that it's, it's, it's mm building up a skillful way of watching uh, the mind um, and, and thinking as a big part of what's happening in the mind. Great, thank you. Okay. But you're not alone, let me just say that. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of the more difficult sort of objects and, and it's one that we're so, um, we, we so sort of identify with, with, with me, with who I am and, um, so it's harder to get that little bit of objectivity on, oh, this is simply a thought happening in the mind, in the moment. Mm. See, let's... Mm. Okay, um, uh, Rachel, and then Sila Natha. Hi. Um, this is a common one for me, and I suspect it's common for a lot of people. Um, I'm very tired today in this moment, and um, I have a regular thing of um, holding is happening, um, and it's around um, living in chronic pain. And um, 
Yeah, the holding is happening. And then instantly um, I'm, I'm, my desire, my response is to try and relax that holding um, and to free up some energy because I notice um, um, I'm, I'm more energized after meditation if I can let go of, of, of tension, of holding. Um, but yeah, that's a really common one for me. And, and you're, you're, uh, you mentioned just then about um, becoming embodied um, to, to come to free up the, the, um, the conversation. Um, if you're thinking, if you're aware that thinking's happening, yeah. but um, I I have the opposite. I'm very embodied and um, have spent many years of my life trying to get away from the pain. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I, I sympathise and I have my own relationship to chronic pain, as you yeah. probably know. Um, yeah. So I uh, yeah. So I think, um, in a way, what, what you're, if you can recognize the holding as an, um, an object, this is what's happening. What, what's that holding like? Uh, you know, feeling into that. And if you like relaxing back from, um, so you're not actually trying to change the experience of holding, but if you, re if you can relax back, in a way you, give a bit more energy to the awareness of it, which has a different nature and a different um, quality, uh, a little bit more pleasant uh, usually. And that's helpful, it's helpful for the mind to, especially with, with things like chronic pain, uh, to, there's, there's something already there which can be um, relaxed back into, so it's more of a mental, you know, it's more of a mental relaxation, but it, it might have a physical sort of, um, you know, physically relaxing into the back of the body if there isn't um, too much discomfort and pain there. But a sort of mental relaxing back, ah, holding. Yeah. And, and that will probably have some effect on the holding, but we need to not do it with the expectation that it will or the desire that yeah. it has. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's quite, it's what you're describing, it's quite subtle. And what I'm describing in relation to that is also quite um, subtle, but it's yeah. Yeah, giving that bit more space to awareness. Um, yeah, when pain is quite gross, isn't it? It's a very, very physical, you know, there is tension, there is, there is actually a, a muscle that's, that's hard or tense mm -hmm. or a tendon that's pulling. Um, it's, a, it's a very physical thing. So uh, to, to have a relaxed mind around that physical presence is, um, yeah, it takes some practice. It does. It really but does. I have had it. I've had moments of, oh, yes, uh, that relief. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes we can, we can, well, my experience has been that I've fallen into it. I've fallen, into, oh, right, that made a difference. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and in a way, what, what over time, just working out what, through observation of what were the conditions that helped. And, and I think that sort of what I've, what I've described and what we've been talking about is you know, some of those conditions. Yeah. Thanks. I'm aware it's just past half past 12. Um, I would like to take uh, Sila Martha's um, comment or whatever, and then um, finish. If you do need to go, then of course, um, go. We'll just be another few minutes, hopefully. Yeah, I'll be very brief, uh, Dr. Dave. It is really just to um, to acknowledge uh, your answer to to the first question this morning. That in my own experience, this morning in particular, but quite commonly in my experience, that um, the power of thoughts is such that I have to be very careful about how much attention I give to them because it's just so easy to slip into them without realizing I'm slipping into them. So it's, um, 
you know, it's usually a case of acknowledging, oh yeah, thinking is going on, and then in a way deliberately turning my mind away from it and directing my mind back to the experience of the body, um, rather than risk that um, the thought overtaking. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 that's yeah, that I think that's that's fine. That's really helpful practice. As long as that there are times when you sort of voluntarily allow thoughts to be there and, and be, you know so bring that same quality of curiosity or um wanting to learn wanting to learn about the nature of thoughts and thinking otherwise i think we can end up if, if we only turn turn our back um then we we miss that opportunity to to learn because there's some aversion to the experience of being lost in thoughts usually mm. yeah yeah, but as a strategy, uh, yeah, I completely get what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Okay, so um, just to let you know, reviews, for those of you that have reviews, um, they're starting this afternoon. And also just about a dozen people came to the um, the 7.30 meditation this morning, um, just an open sit. So if you want that extra support and particularly if you're if you're working this week and you're not able to make many of the live sessions then just to remind you there's that that option to sit with others from the retreat from 7 30 to yeah 8 15 or, or slightly longer if you want to sit longer um moksha is doing a session this afternoon um from five to six moksha has um a lot of experience with this practice and um has a really lovely way into it. I uh, really enjoy his lead meditations. And I know they've been really well received on previous retreats. So um, I look forward to that uh, five and to seeing, seeing you there. Okay, have a good afternoon. Yeah.